I'm Mark Edwards, welcome to Travelog and welcome to Tong Run in northeastern Guizhou. I've come to their city centre to admire three of China's most famous cultural symbols. They are Confucianism, Buddhism and Taoism. Now, I'm not going to give the game away, but one of those guys is going to feature a little more in the rest of the episode. Anyway, I've also been told that Tongren people are really into their fishing and they love to eat. But on top of loving to eat, they love chilly, spicy food. So I'm going to hopefully enjoy some of that. But above all, they are very proud of their clean, clear water and the amazing scenery that surrounds them. Let's see if they're right. Getting to Tongren can be a little tricky, but don't let that deter you. Tongren is Guizhou's hidden gem, and the effort to get there will be amply rewarded. There are 350,000 people living in Tongren County, and around 70% of them are from ethnic minorities. So this is the place for you if you want to get a taste of ethnic culture. Tongren literally means bronze man. And the origins of the name can be traced to the legend of a man who found three bronze statues of Confucius, the Buddha and Lao Tzu under that pavilion. This pavilion built in 1516 is called the Kwa Ao Ting or the Pass the Examination Pavilion. By tradition, seven days before the imperial examination was held, Local officials would hold a ceremony here to wish all the students from Tongren success. Just a little pointer, it's called a pavilion if it doesn't have a wall, and with walls it's a pagoda. Something the pavilion shows is that Tongren definitely looks after its own. Further into the town is the former home of a Tongren native and martyr called Joey Chun. The story goes that he died during the war, protecting his colleagues. Offered the chance to escape, he realized that two female colleagues had been left behind. In the end, he sacrificed himself to ensure that they escaped safely. What a hero! So Tongren's not an especially big city. Well, I think that's a bonus because you get to stroll around at your own pace and find places like this. This house was built in the early 20th century and if anything it feels very different to the ones that I've seen in Beijing, the uh, Suhoyuan or courtyard houses. These ones are all split up so I was just checking out the bedroom and living room. We've got the meeting all here and then just in front of me apparently there's the kitchen and reading room. So very very different. More precisely it was built in 1918 and the house remains a fine example of traditional Chinese architecture. It also displays a minimalist elegance inside with its hard yet comfortable chairs. And there's also a large photograph of the young man who gave his life at the tender age of 35. Can I say this is the uh, Tongren local style, and uh, I'm liking it. It's so simple in a way. You just pick your noodles, they boil them up, then you pick essentially what you want on top. So we've got mushroom, pork, um, slightly fatty pork, and then some beef. 
and then they add all these uh, other little condiments on top, put some soup right onto it, and you've got yourself a wholesome meal for around about five quai. That's absolutely nothing. What a bargain. So simple and great. So if you're into your spice, then you'll be into Guizhou cuisine. Known as one of China's eight famous cuisines, Guizhou food is characterized by its combination of sour and spicy flavors. Bordering both Hunan and Sichuan, places that are renowned for their hot food, Guizhou's spicy dishes come as no surprise. The sourness comes from the pickled vegetables that are ubiquitous in Guizhou homes. The combination may be new to Western taste buds, as it won't be something you're used to, but boy has it got to be tried. Some of the local food is served only during the major Chinese festivals. That's Chinese New Year around February time, and the Qingming Festival around the beginning of April. If you get the chance, make sure to grab a load of the glutinous rice with dried pork. It's also one of the non-spicy dishes if you're put off by too much pepper. Do it. Oh, Okay, now you might, if you've been to China or have watched any shows on China, you'll notice that you'll see a lot of these chicken feet around. And before you start screaming and saying, oh, he's going to eat chicken feet and it's still got the nails on it, which it still does, but one man's chicken feet is another man's caviar. So if you can just put the palate across, blank palate, I'm going to try and describe what it feels like to eat a chicken feet. Hmm. So basically, hmm. Oh, wow. Um, it's very bony, but what's the best way to describe it? It's a bit like when you, t you peel off the, when you're having a roast chicken, you peel off the, 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 the fat on the top and it's nice and crisp. That's the kind of thing I always like eating that. Yeah, it's probably not the healthiest thing. But, if you can get past the nails, mm, it's, uh, it's actually pretty good. Fishing is probably the most popular participation sport in the world. Apparently more people go angling or fishing than play organised football. But one thing that's very obvious in Tongren is the enthusiasm with which the local people have embraced fishing. They are absolutely crazy about it. So much so that the local government is doing its best to have the city named the fishing capital of China. Tongren people love to fish at any and all times. So head out to the river on a balmy midweek or weekend night and you'll find scores of people on the bridges and riverbanks, rods in hand. You need to be aware that Tongren is quite a unique place. It might not be all about five-star living and the sort of dime a dozen cultural sites that you can find in most tourist cities in the world. As off the beaten track locations go, this one is right up there. And what gives Tongren its real charm is its everyday life. You can enjoy a glimpse into the rural village life 
and in particular, the ubiquitous role played by water. The water that makes its way down from Fanjing Mountain is said to be amongst the purest in China, and the Tomrunners, if we can call them that, make every possible use of it. Now it's time to see the famed ethnic minorities. There are 26 documented ethnic minorities living in Tongren County, making up a total of around 250,000 people. We're heading up to a typical Tuja village to finally get up close and personal with an ethnic lifestyle. The Tuja form the sixth largest ethnic minority of China, with a total population of over 8 million. They have their own language, which has distinct similarities with Tibetan and Burmese. So I hiked up to a Tuja village in Tongren, and it is a little humid today, but if anything, it makes me appreciate the mineral water that we have flowing from the mountains. Very, very refreshing. But uh, I don't know what that is, so I'm going to go and find out. Hey, show you got gamma. In this village, you need to ditch your laptops and get back to basics. You never have imagined that in the 21st century, you'd find such an old-fashioned way of manufacturing paper. It also serves to illustrate the self-sufficient lifestyle of some of China's ethnic minorities. Vegetables growing all around you, fresh mineral water, and your own paper-making plant. There's definitely still such a thing as living off the land. <laughs> well, uh, that's how they make bamboo paper up in, uh, up in this part of Tongren, and old school, but very impressive. So there are 26 different types of ethnic minorities here in Tongren and we've got three of them right now. They're famous for being excellent dancers, as you can see, and excellent singers. Now we've got the Tuja, the Dong and the Miao. Can you guess which one is which? So let me give you one hint. It's the way they paint their nails. Now, I'm, of course, I'm kidding. It's the clothes that they wear. Have a look. The rich variety of clothing worn by the minorities of Guizhou province offer you a visual feast on a daily basis. Here, the clothing is as much a social and ethnic denominator as it is a decoration. What a woman is wearing can tell you whether she is married or not, what her social status and wealth are, as well as the level of her weaving and embroidery. And above all, if we're going to be honest, they look awesome. <laughs> Tongren has a complex geological makeup, including the features of the outstanding cast topology. On the whole, the terrain in the central area is lower than that of the surrounding areas, even though most of the land in the Tongren region is mountainous. Much like the city of Zhang Jiajie in Hunan province, which is often likened to Tongren, it boasts an abundance of natural resources. Its distinctive geology has produced a marvellous topography characterised by quartz sandstone, forests and valleys. Although the infrastructure still leaves a lot to be desired, what there is manages to fit in with the natural scenery, which has largely been spared the usual ravages brought about by the assault from tourists.
Make your way across to one of the jewels of the Tongren landscape. That is the Tian Sheng Chao, which translates as naturally born bridge. The story goes that over a hundred years ago, the local people began to hear strange sounds from the gorge. Being highly superstitious, they gradually began to vacate the area. It turned out that the sound was in fact the synchronized vibration of the air caused by the movement of the river below. But at least it's left it all free for us. Its purpose now is more than simply to please the eye. In 2007, the area was turned into a reservoir. These days, you can take a boat out and admire the beautiful and imperious surroundings. It's a bit of a trek to get there, but I promise you it'll be worth it. You might just feel like a tiny little ant with a small view of the world, but you'll be surrounded by some of Mother Nature's most wonderful gifts. So don't forget to bring your camera. Did that look like it was raining? Don't you worry, it's actually not. We've come out about 10 minutes drive from Tongren city centre to a beautiful secluded lagoon that's filled with waterfalls all around. Now, one of the other reasons we came out here is because I've been told about a natural bridge that was formed between two very steep cliffs that unfortunately is now buried under water. I'm going to head into the rain and see if I can find it. Although it's been turned into a reservoir, it's still a popular place for nature lovers. You'll see plenty of wildlife around you, but probably without zooming around on a boat. You'll get completely different views from up above and at water level. But even if it's just a chance to see the magnificent waterfalls, with at least half a dozen seemingly sprouting up out of nowhere, this place has got to be seen. Expert's opinion, um, I've never really known how to pick a watermelon and he was saying it's a lot of it's to do with the size so if it's a big watermelon normally it'll taste nice and I asked him if it would be sweet he said probably and also the sound it makes surprisingly so he says this one makes a better sound than the others so I've uh, got myself, a, uh, I didn't really have time for the guy to wear it, but I uh, got myself a nice uh, watermelon. The guy said it will help. I'm feeling a little uh, bunged up today, so it will help. In China, you'll find a lot of these stalls, like these fruit stalls, on the side of the road. And you can just stop off, get yourself some nice fruit. And it's actually culturally in China you'll find that at the end of the meal, more often than not, they will serve the wonderful melon. We're from water to watermelons and then back to water. We've seen the passion for fishing, but another sport that's a popular amateur pastime here is dragon boating. Wherever you come across a stretch of slow moving river, you're almost certain to find a bunch of able bodied men and women in their narrow dragon boats, rowing to the constant beat of a drum. This area is called Ba Huang, and it really is a place where water is arguably the star of the show.
we've done the water and it's time to now continue our positive tour and head up to arguably the number one tourist attraction in the Tongren area. So Fanjing Mountain is an absolute treasure trove of plants and wildlife. We've just chanced upon this rather magnificent waterfall and in terms of plants, over 80% of the forest here are virgin. Now in terms of wildlife, I've been told that over 800 species of animals have been documented, including the Guizhou golden monkey, which is rare and endangered. I'm going to go and explore and maybe find one. The biodiversity in the reserve is unparalleled anywhere else on the same latitude. This is one of the best preserved subtropical forest ecosystems in China, with verdant mountains, clear waters, and a diversified wildlife constituting a unique environment. But in truth, we are here as much for our bird and animal watching as we are for this mountain's Buddhist connections. With its rich natural heritage, this place is sacred to Buddhists. There are temples scattered all around, and it's easy to see why it attracts so much interest. It's highly popular with tourists during the summer and autumn, which are without a doubt the best seasons to visit. So in Buddhism, there are three master Buddhas. One for the past, one for the present, and one for the future. And this uh, rather happy looking chap above me is the one for the future. Now you might also be able to hear a little construction work going on. And that's because the temple is on the verge of completion, which in many ways exemplifies how popular Buddhism still is here and in China as a whole. It might surprise you to learn that the monk Maitreya, known as the Happy Buddha or Laughing Buddha, is in fact not a Buddha at all, but a Bodhisattva, or a Buddha in waiting. He was a companion of the Buddha, designated by him to be his successor. In layman's terms, the system works like this. A Buddha comes and teaches, then over the years, his teachings fade and finally disappear like an echo. Then another Buddha appears to restore the teaching. Succeeding Buddhas are always recognized by their predecessors. There's a saying that nature shaped the fantastic landscape at Fanjing Shan, but it's Buddhism that made it famous. Its reputation as a sacred land for Buddhists can be traced back all the way to the 16th century, and Fanjing actually means pure land of the Buddhists. Now, there's another Buddhist saying which dictates that you need to be full of faith, full of patience, and be able to overcome obstacles if you really want to view the real Buddha. And we've got one such obstacle today, and that is the absolutely dreadful weather that we're having. But, we'll see how we get on. Fanjing Mountain is a holy site for Buddhists, and the religious atmosphere enhances its charm. I don't want to oversell this, but you will be, or you should be, absolutely blown away when you make it to the top. Fanjing Mountain is situated 90 kilometers south of Tongren City. And in truth, our half day up here definitely wasn't enough. <laughs> Rising like a picture from a Hayao Miyazaki animation, you'll see the temple on the golden summit looking down on you. You can't begin to imagine the work that went into constructing a place like that, so high up and so seemingly inaccessible. But in many ways, it typifies the best things about Tongren. It's mysterious, it's surreal, and it's an effort to get to. But you'll find it an altogether rewarding experience. So I made it to the top, 8,000 steps. And the cable car on the route was a bit of a cheat, but still, we beat the weather and an appalling lack of fitness. And I managed to see the Golden Summit. Now, unfortunately, that's all the time we've got left for today. But I really hope you've enjoyed touring Fanjing Shan and amongst all, having a look around Tongren. I'm Mark Edwards, and I'll catch you very soon on another episode of Travel Log. <laughs>